I invite you to take your Bibles once more and turn in the New Testament to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. This morning we'll consider verses 1 through 5. I remind you that this is God's Word, His inspired, inerrant, infallible, and holy Word. So let's give our attention to its reading. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the Church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, this morning we begin a new study, a new series through a new book, 1 Thessalonians. For those who have been around for the past 13 years, We've covered nearly the entirety of the New Testament. In fact, we're running out of books. After 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and perhaps Philemon, we have John, Revelation, and Mark left. And then we'll start all over. But two weeks ago, we finished the book of Colossians, one of Paul's prison epistles, along with Philippians, Ephesians, and Philemon. 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus also fall into that category. Though they are often thought of in a separate category, actually, as Paul's pastoral epistles. Thessalonians is often grouped with Galatians, Romans, and Corinthians. Letters that Paul wrote when he was freely ministering during his missionary journeys. Thessalonians would most likely have been written during his second missionary journey from the city of Corinth. In fact, some believe that this letter is the first epistle that the Apostle Paul wrote. It's a tie maybe between Galatians and Thessalonians. But here in Thessalonians, there is nothing uh, of the struggles over justification by faith alone, or the problems with Judaizers that we find in most all of his other letters. I don't know that it matters to know ex the exact ordering of the letters that Paul wrote. He wrote to various regions with various backgrounds and various struggles. They would have had all of these differences, even if he had written them all within the span of a week. But this letter is written to a church that was near and dear to Paul's own heart. And in fact, the main idea of this letter is to express Paul's thankfulness that he had for the success of the preaching of the word among the Thessalonians. His desire was to further establish them in the faith and to persuade them to live holy lives. All of this will have to do with the fact that they are waiting. They are a people who are waiting, waiting patiently for their Savior's return. That's actually why we pair this, I think, with the servant songs of Isaiah. For the Old Testament saints had to learn to wait patiently for the Lord. But they too were called to readiness and faithfulness as they trusted in God's promises. And indeed, they would find their strength in that. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength, we read in Isaiah chapter 40. Well then, the immediate importance of this epistle to us is clear. For we also are a people who wait. We also are a people who need to be encouraged and strengthened in our faith. We also are a people who must be called to holiness in our lives. And we are a people 
that we can give thanks. That is, that <clears throat> your pastor gives thanks for, for sure, as do your elders. We can be thankful for one another. And so let us look together at an introduction of, our, of, of, of this epistle this morning. It begins there very, very commonly how Paul begins in all of his epistles. You know, oftentimes he simply cites his own name because many times he is alone. That is particularly true while in prison. Uh, um, but here he cites himself as well as two others, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Paul we know quite well. He was the last of the apostles, that is, the last called an apostle. Christ appearing to him last of all, he says, on the road to Damascus. We read of this in Acts chapter 9. He was traveling there in order to continue the persecution of the Christians. And he was confronted by the resurrected Christ. And in that moment, Paul's entire world was turned upside down. He no longer looked askance at Christ. He no longer saw that Jesus needed to measure up to some Old Testament standard that he had, that is, that Paul had. But rather, Paul came to understand all of the promises of the Old Testament as yes and amen in Jesus. Timothy was Paul's young associate that joined him, we read in Acts chapter 15, after John Mark, abandoned the first missionary journey. He is called Paul's son in the faith and was one that he sent to places in order to encourage the Christians to in, in order to strengthen the church in his own absence. He has sent Timothy to Thessalonica to check on them and to report back. And then Silvanus, he's also known as Silas in the book of Acts. He was a prophet in the early church who was sent with Paul to convey the decision of the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 to the churches. That was the decision that had rejected any obligation for the Gentile Christians to follow the Mosaic ceremonial law, especially circumcision. Silas had been imprisoned with the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 16 and witnessed the Lord's deliverance and the subsequent salvation of the Philippian jailer, he and his household. And he also accompanied Paul to Thessalonica. And so Paul actually begins his epistle not simply because he wants to show the authority that he has because he's with Timothy and Silvanus. Paul has authority because he is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know this from other epistles where Paul makes that very clear. But since the purpose of this letter, first and foremost, is to give thanks to the church, Paul cites these other two brothers who are with him because they knew those men as well. well who are they? This is the church of the Thessalonians. In Acts chapter 17, we read actually of the beginnings of this church. We read in chapter 17 of Acts, beginning in verse 1, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom. And on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. And taking some of the wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. This sets the stage, not only the establishment of the church, imagine that, only three, three weeks of preaching, and already the church has begun. It not only sets the stage for the beginnings of the church, but also for the challenges that would be against them. For not only would the Jews who were riled up in order to oppose them. Now we want, we want to make it clear here, this is not an, an ethnic thing. Because many of the Jews actually believed Paul and joined and trusted in Christ. And Paul himself was a Jew, which gave him the authority to speak in the synagogue. But rather, these are those who opposed, those who opposed Christ. Who opposed the church. And they would be joined 
they would be joined also by the Gentiles. Anyone who wished to put down the church because, and this is key, because they had turned the world upside down and they are saying there is another king, Jesus. You see, this will be the foundation of the persecution against the Thessalonian church. And it should not surprise us. For after all, this is the very same accusation that they brought against Christ himself. Luke 23 and verse 2, we read, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. The very persecutions of Paul and the rejection of Christ will be the lot of these Thessalonian Christians. So they are suffering, and Paul desires to encourage them. He begins by encouraging them in the God they serve. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. This is not simply an introduction that we speed past. Rather, we want to understand how he, how he connects here the Thessalonian believers who are suffering and being rejected, who are struggling undoubtedly through various kinds of trials and tribulations, and he wants to encourage them because they are in God, in Christ. Indeed, wherever the church may gather, be it in Thessalonica, Corinth, Rome, or Hillsdale, the people of God are in the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no church apart from the one who is to be worshipped. Paul says that they are in God. They are in Christ. This is his classic language that speaks of their union with God. Their communion with Him. Even thinking about their need for encouragement. How much more can there be? If God is for us, who can be against us? And we do know that it's the Father and Jesus Christ. You might wonder, why no Holy Spirit? After all, the Apostle Paul affirms the triune God, and that is absolutely true. He's not excluded. Just look down in verse 5, the power of the Holy Spirit. Taking these verses together, then we see the importance and the place of the triune God in, in the salvation of His people. Just as the Apostle Paul would speak in Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14, and explain very clearly there that our salvation is grounded not in our own abilities, not in our own works, but rather in the God who saves. He goes on to speak of what it is that they know, grace and peace. This is Paul's standard greeting, sometimes included with mercy as well. And it never gets old, for it reminds us that we are recipients of undeserved favor from God. That is what grace is. Undeserved favor. And that this undeserved favor has secured for us peace with God. No longer at enmity with Him, and not just peace with God, but a deep peace with one another. For He's writing to the church of Jesus Christ. A people who not only have union with Christ, but they have communion with one another. And notice here that Paul is writing to this congregation. Indeed, that's the point that I like to draw out from time to time. Paul does not write generally to individual Christians. It is so easy for us to read the New Testament and think individually of us alone, by ourselves, our faith. But that is never in view in Scripture. Indeed, in the Old Testament, for an Israelite to be apart from the people was a curse. It was not a blessing. It was not something they just thought of me and Yahweh off on our own. No. It is God who saves, yes, and God saves individuals, yes, but He saves individuals to be part of a community. We see that in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament as well. Paul then begins to give thanks, and this is again his, his standard approach when he writes his epistles. He introduces himself, he, he says something about the people and their relationship to the Lord, and then he goes on to give thanks for them. And this doesn't do it all the time, but many of his epistles will follow this. We give thanks to God always for all of you. His opportunity for thankfulness, he sees it as constant constant. 
He shows the communion of the saints and the connection between believers. For the Apostle Paul knew these saints at Thessalonica. But he was only there a very short time before things blew up and he had to leave. But because they are in Christ, because they are in God, he has communion with them. And so he gives thanks to God for them. It is true we can thank one another when it is appropriate to do so. But here Paul reminds us that we have to thank the Lord for each other. We thank God for the gifts and the graces that He has given as well as the ways we are encouraged by one another in the faith, love, and hope. The central ideas that we'll come to in this letter. He says that He gives thanks always for all of you. This is no exaggeration or generalization. Paul was thankful for them all. Indeed, I receive letters from time to time. Usually those letters are from parents of students who worship with us during the school year. And they often thank me for my labors. But then they go on to give thanks for all of you. They give thanks for all of you because the church is not one person. It is not the pastor. However, often his voice might be heard the most. And in my case, the loudest. Paul gives thanks for all of them. And those, notice the method of his thankfulness constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Remembering before our God and Father. Again, this is Paul's pattern. And it's a pattern that we don't want to rush by. Colossians 1, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Philippians 1, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for all for you all, making my prayer with joy. Ephesians 1, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not give cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Romans 1, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers. You notice the pattern. The method of Paul's thankfulness is in prayer to God. He is thankful to the Lord because it is God who is the one who builds His church. After all, Jesus says that He will build His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And there was Paul in that first century proclaiming Christ is risen. And of course the gates of hell were continually pushing against the church. Continually trying to convince people within the church in order to switch out their message or to abandon it altogether. We have something in common with these saints of the first century, do we not? We live in a world that sees the church and sees the gospel message as ridiculous, as foolish. Do something. Don't just pray. There's better things to do with your Sunday than gathering for worship. And yet the reality is that this is what God is doing. He's building His church. And so just like in the first century, we must continue faithful, trusting in the Lord, and giving thanks for one another. Look at the cause of the thankfulness there. He says, for your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> I must confess, when I began to exegete this text on Monday morning, I simply saw faith, love, and hope, and I went, there it is. There's that string that connects this to all of, other, all of Paul's other letters. He speaks so often about faith, hope, and love, and yes, here he reverses that order. In 1 Corinthians 13, he says, Now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And notice how he words it a bit differently here. From a second reading, I could see he says, Your work of faith, your labor of love, your steadfastness of hope. Before we break these down, we want to note that Paul understands that the Christian life, and especially the Christian community, it takes effort. It takes work. This might be a surprise to you, but it should not be. The truth is that we might not always feel 
connected to the church. This can be because of our own personality or others, or simply because of the spiritual valley that we are walking through at the time. I get those letters sometimes too. My counsel is often the same. Move towards the people of God, not away from them. For Paul makes clear here that our faith, hope, and love, or our faith, love, and hope, that there are something, there are things that, that go along with them. He begins by saying a work of faith. Now, faith is not a work. We want to be careful and understand what Paul is saying here. It is not a work, but faith works. You see, there are evidences of the faith. This is how James says it in James 2. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Our confession affirms this. He said, where it says in chapter 11, faith thus receiving and resting upon Christ in his righteousness is the alone instrument of justification. Yet is it not alone in the person justified? but is ever accompanied with all other saving graces, and is no dead faith, but worketh by love. The Apostle Paul gives thanks for this work of faith. Also the labor of love. It's the word that he uses here, the word for labor, it speaks of the physical toil, the kind of physical toil that leaves aches and pains. John Calvin, in his commentary here, speaks of the cultivation of love. The idea of toil or cultivation reminds us that it not only takes work, but it takes time. And anyone who's been part of a church for any length of time understands that this is true. It takes time for our community to come together. It takes time to feel those connections and to build those up and to strengthen them with one another. And so Paul gives thanks for the work of faith, the labor of love. And lastly, for the steadfastness of hope. Steadfastness of hope. Here it speaks of patience. Remember, hope in Scripture is not the way that we tend to think about it. Well, I hope I get this, or I hope I can do that. It is not wishful thinking. Indeed, the word that we would often use for the word hope would be sort of that big eschatological that final, glorious hope of the new heavens and the new earth. It's that hope. You notice that he pairs it with steadfastness, patience, waiting. We all know how this works. There, 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 there are children among us, uh, and the parents have hopes for them. But there's a lot of patience involved, isn't there? There's a lot of waiting involved. There's a lot of struggle and trial involved. So Paul is giving thanks because these things are present within the Thessalonian church. Now make no mistake, he doesn't simply end here and say, well, you've got it all figured out, congratulations. No, he's going to go on throughout the entirety of the letter in order, to, in order to, to draw these things out and to provide further instruction. Their presence reminds us of the need for the growth of them. And again, we can understand that. For though faith may be present within us, and we may trust in the Lord, there are times when that trust wavers and struggles and must be strengthened. This is the work of God in His Word and by His Spirit within our lives. And Paul then turns to speak of the authority the grounding of the church, if you will. Paul knew that his ministry as an apostle was authoritative, but it wasn't about his personal authority or his position. He describes himself often as a servant or a slave of God, a messenger of Jesus Christ. He goes on to speak of his own knowledge of this there in verse 4. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. First, he calls them brothers. Acknowledging their familial connection. 
Paul's love for the saints was not a sterile or disconnected love. But rather, he sees them as, as, as family. He sees them as connected. And second, he says that they were loved by God. They were loved by God. And we know that this becomes the center point of it all. For, for if God had not so loved the world, he would not have given his only begotten son. Indeed, if God had not loved the world, then he never would have made it. If God had not loved us, he would not have redeemed us from our sin. And this is where Paul reminds them that not only are they loved by God, he says, we, we know that we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. The word here is that He has elected you. Contrary to some views, then, there is no contradiction or tension between God's merciful love for sinners and His electing grace. In fact, they go together perfectly well in the Apostles' understanding. For the love of God grounds election. It is electing love. This was part of Paul's authority, his knowledge of God's electing love. Not only is there no tension between God's love and election, but there's also no tension between God's election and the assurance of salvation. The Apostle Paul tells us why in this passage. He sees these believers are bearing the fruit of what it means to trust in Christ. That is faith. Love and hope. They are being built up in these three things and growing and increasing in them. Jesus says that you will know them by their fruit. If a tree wants to know if it was a certain kind of tree, you would, not, you would need nothing more than to look at the fruit that it bore, the orchard in which it was planted, the way it was being nourished. Now, this isn't a call by Jesus in order for us to become fruit inspectors, as though we need to have perfect fruit. But rather, if there is fruit of Christian life at all, it can only be by the work of the Spirit, the Apostle Paul says. For he goes on to say, we know that you are loved, chosen by God, because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but then he goes on to speak of the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, for the Apostle Paul, it is God who chooses. It is the gospel that calls. And this is what has established the church. Now, this makes sense, of course, for the Apostle Paul speaking to Thessalonians, right? He was there three weeks. He proclaimed the gospel for three weeks. And the church sprung up. It was clear that they had believed the message. He says, our gospel came to you. God's love indeed is central in this story, but that love is known in the gospel. This is the message of Christ as the sacrifice for our sins, that He lived, died, and rose again so that we might have eternal life. It does come in word, as we read in Acts chapter 17. The Apostle Paul was, was reasoning with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving to them that it was necessary for the Christ to rise, and to suffer and to rise from the dead. The Apostle Paul will say elsewhere that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they to call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? The Word was central, and so we don't want to think that here the Apostle Paul, when he says, not only in word, or not in word only, as though he's dismissing the Word. Well, the word is central, but also, he says, in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. This, of course, is necessary. For if, if someone were to get up and to proclaim Jesus Christ to a room full of people, it's not like that would automatically create a church. No, it is only the work of the Spirit. Here he says that it came in power and in the Holy Spirit. The word power means that it has the ability to do something. I think the gospel is always, always comes with power. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. 
in discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Or as God says in Isaiah 55, when He speaks there of His Word, He speaks of it bringing forth what He has purposed, just as the rain falling from the ground causes the seed to sprout. But know that the power is not some abstraction. It's in the work of the Holy Spirit. It's in the work of the Holy Spirit. Here we see that third person of the Godhead brought together with the Father and the Son who redeems the people of God. As our catechism reminds us that the Holy Spirit applies to us the redemption purchased by Christ by working faith in us and thereby uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling. This is how Paul says it in Ephesians 1. He says, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, the praise of His glory. The Holy Spirit then empowers the messenger, that is the Apostle Paul, who proclaimed the good news. But the Spirit not only empowers the messenger, but the message itself. So that it draws, so that it convicts, so that it changes. This is a reminder to us, beloved, that our gathering together for worship, to hear the Word of God, it is not ordinary. It is supernatural. Just as we read in Hebrews chapter 12, we ascend that holy Mount Zion and we gather in the presence of our God. That whatever it is we have faced in this day, in this week, that we draw near to our God through Jesus Christ. And so Paul says that they receive the word. He goes on to say, not only through power in the Holy Spirit, but with full conviction. This idea of conviction then becomes important. For remember the Thessalonians and the struggles that they would face. It would be important for their assurance, but also for their perseverance in the faith. And it is true, beloved, that we might not face the persecutions that they did. But our gathering and our labors are no less full in need, in need of, the, of this full conviction of what the Apostle Paul speaks here. Our hearing the word is no less needs the work of the Spirit. And indeed, the truth is, is that this is what God is working among us. And so the call to us in these opening verses then becomes the very things for which Paul gives thanks for the Thessalonians. The work of faith, the labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope. These immediately become practical in our lives as we, as we look and, and, and see the things that we face day by day. And the moments when we are tempted to turn away from our call, that is from the proclamation or our profession of faith. The way in which the world continues, just as it did in the days of the Thessalonians, to seek to woo us away, to take us away from the one who loves us, from our God. So we shouldn't be surprised that the Christian community called together is a community that works together. That there's a labor of love for one another. A steadfastness of hope. And a work of faith. By God's grace, may He continue to work this within our lives, even as we continue to understand more and more of what these mean as we begin this new study 